Oh, good afternoon again, everybody. Are you tired yet? No. Are you enjoying yourselves? Yes. yes. Right, I keep answering, asking that of all the sessions, but I want to make sure you still are. Now, does everybody know what's going to happen now? No. no. Well, it's a surprise, so that's what it's all about. This session is entitled Talking Heads. Uh, some of you might know the Alan Bennett series from yes. years ago. Yes. It's kind of along those lines. So the idea is that you're witnessing a conversation on the platform. Okay. So our speakers are going to kind of ignore you. That's the right expression. So you're, you're eavesdropping into their conversation. So the idea is to learn from them and share in their experiences. Perhaps they might well do sitting at home having a cup of tea, which is what they're trying to do. We've got two wonderful speakers for you who I know need no introduction here at the college. We've got Mavis Patilla, uh, who's an official to the Spiritualist National Union and a former senior tutor here at the college as well, too, and a regular visitor <coughs> to you as well. It's lovely to have Mavis back. Thank you. We also have Paul Jacobs as well, too, again, needs no introduction here, an international medium like Mavis, working extensively throughout this country and abroad, too. So. I think it's fair to say that both Paul and Mavis are good friends, and I think you're going to see that coming out from the conversation that you're going to witness. So literally, I'm going to say over to Mavis and Paul to chat away. Please welcome Mavis and Paul. go back, you know, 30 years with each other and, you know, we both experienced so much, but we're so comfortable with each other, we can chat honestly about the things we've done and the things we're doing and also even our own insecurities at this, this time, you know, uh, because even with that experience, we, we still have done and also question, you know, are we very right and what we're doing is right for today and uh, things have changed so much over the they have, haven't they? But, oh God, you remember going back in the times when you'd come into the library and, and Gordon's eyes would drop on you and he'd say, come up, get up, and you'd say, oh God, is there anybody there? <laughs> and, um, um, I can't fail, I mustn't do this and I've got to do that. And, and you get up here and he says, just go out of your head and you just do it. You would, you, you would just, whatever he asked you to do, you would just do it. Even if it was something you'd never done before, you know. And if you said no to it, you wouldn't ask you again. You no. just have the courage to do whatever he asked you to do. You know, be with. I remember once coming into the library and uh, there was, a, you know, one of those changing screens there. Yeah, I remember. And uh, he got us up and he said, right, he said, I want you to do a demonstration for this person behind the screen. And you've got no answers, no, no help whatsoever. We didn't get anything. And we had to do this reading for this person behind the screen. And he couldn't have chosen a worse person because it was the chairman of the college. And I'm going back, yes, I don't mean I'll now. And okay, I'm going back to the beginning. And goodness gracious me, I'm frightened. But if you really thought you had the potential, he'd really throw you in the deep end of things. And I can remember him um, coming down, he says, you know, he says, you need a few days holiday, why don't you drive me down to the college? And I wasn't really a working medium as such, I was still developing. And we were in the gallery and he says, see the young man down there? And I says, yes. He says, he needs an assessment, you go and, go and do it for him. I said, I don't do assessments. He says, you do now. <laughs> <laughs> so afterwards, I, I did the assessment and I came out and he said, what did you say to him? I said, I told him not to do his day job and become a full-time professional medium. And he looked at me and he smiled and he says, that's correct. I says, that's what you wanted me to do because you didn't want to tell him about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> But in a way, I think when we look at the way he taught, which is quite different to what we have today, in a way he taught us but didn't teach us, he would sort of want to see if you could discover the answers for yourself. I think that the, the, the wonder of it was you could trust his judgment on the side you couldn't you? So if he was dropping on you and saying to you, no, just get up and do that, uh, you just knew if he believed you could do it and he believed in you, that, that you could do it, 
and, and it actually gave you that power to get up. So yeah, you didn't have your own belief in yourself, he gave you the belief. That, that, that's true. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. often the things I did for the very first time, it was always because he just told me, I'd go and do it. And, yeah. I, and I thought so was you. you know, well, if he's asking me to do it, then he must believe I can. Yeah. And that gave you that confidence to, yeah. to just go for it and, and do it. I remember when I came into the movement, and um, you could, you know, you, could, you remember, we could do diagnosis in those days, it's against the law now, but I remember him training me in diagnosis, and um, I'd gone in, I used to go down to Longton then, and um, I'd gone in to do this assessment on this person's health and came out and I got it wrong. So he sent me back in and I came out and I got it wrong and he sent me back in. And in the end I was in tears and he had to go and do it himself. <laughs> and I never got it right on that day. Uh, I was speaking on the radio in uh, America recently and uh, Gary Gordon came up in the training that we issued and I was talking about psychometry, you know, today students, if you say, you know, we're going to do psychometry, they pull a face, the face drops, I say, what's the matter? And say, well, we've done that before. Mm -hmm. But he was very much a firm believer of that being the foundation of people's development. Mm -hmm. and, and I know you did psychometry with him, um, mm -hmm. um, and I did, I can even remember when I was a student coming to your house and you continued making us do things with psychometry too. And people yeah. probably believe that the finest medium he was, with his private clients at home, he always began his sittings with some commentary, so he could get to know his sitter. Yes, I, I, I think psychometry is very important. Actually, that's the only gift we've got to give away, because it's our own soul giving away. Right. The communication between the two worlds is a union, but I honestly believe that the psyche is so important, as long as we are admitting that it's the psyche. And I think that one of the problems I've noticed, I don't know if you've noticed, but some of the um, students today they don't know the difference between when they're in the psyche yeah. and when they're in communication. And everything gets put down to the spirit world. Right. And I remember him saying to me once, you know, um, remember you've got to go to the spirit world. You're going to die one day, you know, and you're going to go over there. And what are you going to say that to the people over there if you've taken the name in vain? Right. And that really pulled me up. And, uh, and really, I enjoyed you in the psyche, do you? Oh, and I can remember the door saying, give me a damn good psyche, get me down. He said he really enjoyed that aspect of it. And uh, that was one of my mistakes in the beginning in my development. And it's the same with a lot of students today. They want to jump straight to spirit communication. And they've got no understanding the development of the psyche of, uh, with their own soul, which you mean she has to walk through and work through. And I had to actually take a step back and go back to spending more time working with developing that psychic aspect of from within my own soul because I've neglected that in my development. Yeah, I, th I, I think it's essentially important that we, that we do continue training them on the psychic level and awareness and blending. I think the awareness and the blending that we did with Gordon was unique right. because um, it, it wasn't really meditation, it was actually the discipline of blending with the spirit world or blending with your own soul and I just love that part of it. I just loved it. I remember being in here once and um, uh, listening to him and then suddenly I'd done astral projection and I was out in the corridor uh, and after uh, the session was over he came up to me and he said, well, um, was I that boring that you had to go and have a look around the hall? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that was the first time I'd done astral projection but, but he had been talking about blending at the time and blending with our own soul. And, uh, and what I found with Gordon was that he, the aspect of the human soul, the soul we have here, and how we should respect that, and we should respect the spirit within ourselves, um, so that we ultimately know uh, that we're expanding that part of us, um, where I find quite often we prefer the spirit world to do everything for us. That's right. And, and often other people put the psyche as something lesser um, in what we do, and it's not. And I was driving, taking you somewhere in the car, um, and I said to him, when I'm ready to start working professionally, and I do sittings, I'm only going to see people who are grieving and have lost somebody. And I thought he'd be really pleased with me. Yeah. Yeah. And he looked at me and he said, who are you to decide that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. said, I did exactly the same. Somebody's <laughs> grieving for a loss of a business, yeah. a broken relationship. Yeah. Yeah. He said, entitled to help just as much as somebody who's grieving for somebody who's yeah. grieving. I think the one thing you said to me was, you know, anybody that's lost their job or lost their business will be grieving. 
which ones they've left, lost their way of life. You know, so don't pick and choose. So I got into trouble for that one as well. I, don't, I mean, yeah. even though he was president of the union, he was terrible for Brian Keeper. You know, he was the, when, he, when he passed the screen world, I um, had to take over the healing um, session on a Tuesday night at his church. And the first evening, this guy came in for the healing room, and he sat there and opposite me, and uh, straight away, he just placed a ring into my hand, and I said, what's that for? And he said, to psychometrize. I said, well, this is a healing session. We don't do psychic psychometry readings. He said, well, Gordon always did it for me. <laughs> said, well, why did he do psychometry when he's healing? He said, well, it's my wife who's, who's not physically able to come, and uh, he can let me know how she's getting on and what advice. You can give me for the healing that's needed uh, for her. I thought, well, if Gordon can do it, can do it. Then. Okay, I'll have a go and I'll do it. You know. Um, yeah, I, th I think the psychic interaction, understanding how strong the power is of soul. Um, actually, I think it most gives the spirit world a holiday at times because it's always the spirit world did this or the spirit world did that or. And, and, and do you know, I just had some document well a, a while ago paperwork sent to me and you know the spirit world have given me this no if they haven't your soul's given that and the disappointment on the girl's face that you know it wasn't the spirit world that had actually passed that information it was a soul she couldn't see the miracle that actually the soul had passed that to her so she'd done it herself but you would have thought I'd said the worst thing in the world to her that it was her that had done it knowledge and understanding and awareness in our own soul that our conscious mind's not aware of and, mm. and if we can open and understand and allow that to open and come out um, so much our own soul can give and share with people yeah yeah but i mean i still like to go back to the the years when i used to um I, the spirit world i always used to see them and i'd say oh don't sit there my dad sat there or don't sit there that's the cat and i'd, I'd shock everybody in the house i loved it and then we used to go to the, out to the clubs and I'd be looking at someone on the table and I'd think, hmm, they're, they're doing something quite naughty. And, and they know that I was looking and I loved it. It was, it was powerful. Um, you know, I was one of those mediums in the early days that they used to call the leaky medium. Um, the early days because you're so excited and eager with what you're discovering with your awareness that you can't just help what it is. Knows, I mean, I even do. Nearly even from sitting on an airplane or on a train, it nearly got me into trouble. Like, I went into the smoking carriage on this train, and asked this young lady if I could sit opposite, so I could have a cigarette. And I put my little nose into her aura, you know. And, um, <laughs> and all of a sudden, I nearly got myself into trouble. She was going to call the police. She says, Why are you looking at me strange? I think she thought I was going to attack her or something. And I said, I'm sorry, I said, yeah, excuse me, I'm one of these strange people who see things. And uh, I explained to her, so then I spent the rest of the journey from England to Scotland doing a reading on the train. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been a short journey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do think that, that uh, what I love about um, what we do is that, that actually it should be the whole person. It should be the soul, the spirit within, as well as the discarnate, it has to be the incarnate that's responsible for what we're doing. Um, but I, I did find that I loved it. I loved it when I felt that I'd got it on, you know. You get a bit egotistical, don't you, at the beginning. Mm, I got something you haven't got. <laughs> Let me tell you. And then, of course, you want to, you want to prove it to everybody, don't you? You want to push it down everybody's throat. So we had a lot of friends and we lost them all because they were fed up with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, do you know your grandmother's present? You know, and getting beyond that stage, I think, was, was difficult. Sorry, I lost all my friends. Yeah, you do. Outside of, oh, you're not going to another one of those things with dead people, are you? Yeah, and <laughs> the other thing that's difficult with it, isn't it, is how you can read your family. Yeah. So, you know, when they should be having private thoughts about you thinking, you know, she's not, not done this right or she's not done that right. And they'll read, you're reading what they're thinking. So you have an argument with them and they've not said a word. <laughs> <laughs> but because you've heard it, you have a go. Do you know what I mean? And, and I really, really, I try and talk about that a bit to, to, to some of the students because it really is difficult at the beginning when the psyche is running, isn't it? Um, you know, you lie and say, well, the spirit world are telling me that you've got somebody um, that you're seeing on the side, 
or you, how often do we say, and I sense that this is what you're doing. We don't do it, do we? Um, but I know it can cause arguments. And the other thing is, did you get in, did you have arguments about noise? I had a lot of arguments at the beginning about noise. If they had the radio on too loud, or the television was too loud, or they were all sat round talking, and I'd go in after doing a service, and I'd be so holy and so heavenly, and I was in this illumined state. And you know, the dinner had been burnt, and the washing wasn't finished, and the electric bill needed paint. And I walked into this, and I don't want to hear all this at the moment. I just need some time. Just give me time. You know. Um, and, and it does cause rouse, doesn't it? I don't know how many uh, people I've talked to. Um, and some people say, oh no, it doesn't. It's just made my home more spiritual. But it didn't do that with me. It made it more argumentative. You know, Why don't you understand me? <laughs> because I can't do what you do. Well, <clears throat> <laughs> All those stages that you go through when you start out. So I can argue with other people on the other side of the coin because I, you know, I enjoy a drink, I enjoy a cigarette, so I know you don't mind a GT and you like your faggots as well. And people think it was like totally wrong that we who we are and do what we do and that we shouldn't do normal but physical things. They still do it now, don't oh. they? Especially when you oh I better not say that. Anyway, <laughs> I just showed the camera uh, But in some countries, I'll put it that way, it can be in some countries, and um, uh, and you know, you're out there, I'm, I'm having a cigarette and my cup of coffee, and someone will come out and say, don't you think that's very unspiritual? Should your your body not be a kingdom? And I said, well, it is a kingdom, but it's my kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> When I come back from this great world, they won't need any evidence to be able to smell my nicotine. <laughs> <laughs> or they'll see the smoke rising. But at the end of the day, with, with the psyche, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with that level of work. The only time I have a problem is like what you're saying, is with the same is coming from somebody in the spirit world, but when, when it's not. Um, the other one that gets me a little bit is with everything they do or don't do, the guys told them to do it. Yeah. Like, do you remember when you had the accident in the supermarket and you slipped on the banana? Yeah. And they said, oh, that, that was the spirit world made that happen because uh, you needed to rest. Yeah, that was it. I needed to rest. That was it. That was awful, wasn't it? No. Then, uh, then the next thing was I had a bad throat and the spirit world was shutting me up. Well. <laughs> um, but we do have a, we do, we do, we, that's still going on though, isn't it? Where people are still saying, you know, the spirit world did, did this and I've got to have a rest, so that's why I've got the bad sprain in my leg or something. But I do remember that. But it is difficult, you know, uh, we should not say with the whole person, and it's getting that, you know, we live in a physical world which we've got to be part of, but also then we've got this heightened sensitivity which sometimes we can hypersensitive mm -hmm. and overreact to things we wouldn't react to before, mm -hmm. but also getting the balance right between the spiritual aspects of our expression and the physical life and getting that balance between the two aspects. And I think that, that you're quite right. I call that being hyperpsychic. So if I've read somebody and I know it's going to cause a row, I'm just being a bit hyperpsychic. Let me calm down and I'm you know, going on from there. But I do think we can become oversensitive with mediumship at the beginning and the psyche because we don't know the difference. Yeah. And I think that that's it. I mean, I believe that the spirit world actually, um, uh, the spirit world did everything for me at the beginning. And I was really disappointed to find out that really actually they didn't. So then I was the opposite side, when, when um, you know, I was asked to do things in my very early years, when I, and even like the first time I came here, I didn't even know I was a medium. Uh, I was just experiencing things, but I thought it was the place I was staying in, not me, that was my thing that happened. Uh, I came there, never been in any development, and Gordon got me out and asked me to make a contact. I said, mate, he says, yes, yeah, sure. I said, I don't know how to do it. And he just said, he says, well, ask you mm -hmm. And I did it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it worked. Um, but I, afterwards, though, I tried to find explanation other than the spirit world. Yeah. For quite some time, I used to try to no, there's got to be another explanation that could be aware of this or experience that. And I always put down to the spirit world last. And I 
you say I think so often people try to put everything down to the spirit world oh, too I much, too I quickly. Absolutely, the spirit world were amazing, absolutely amazing. And I mean, I used to see the spirit world, so I was what you call an objective seer. And so when I first went to the platform, I used to see the spirit world as clearly as I'm looking at you. And I used to hear them as clearly as I'm hearing your voice. Um, and it was brilliant, because I didn't have to do anything, I was just there. And then one day I go to do a, ch a service and I stand up and I say, you know, I'm a, a, I'm a medium and I'm a, an objective clairvoyant and I'm an objective clairaudience and nothing happened. <laughs> I didn't pick anything up. I didn't see anybody, I didn't hear anybody. And <coughs> then all I kept getting was these pictures and obviously my clairvoyant vision I had to go subjective for the work I was doing. Uh, but oh, that was a nightmare, that. And I've never had it back as well as I had it then. But, well, it's the same lines in the beginning, before I actually got involved in development, um, I had often seen objectively here, objectively. You scared the living day, I was saying. Mm. So I used to say, go away, I don't want to talk to you, dive under the bed covers. Mm. And they were regressive, because it's very rare I, I get anything uh, in an objective way. Uh, if I do, it's not normally on the platform, it's more just in a casual situation, like say we might be talking now, mm. so I might see somebody objectively, but yeah. not to the degree in the way it was in those very early days. Well, I think we've got to switch it off. I mean, it's lovely to have a break from it, isn't it? And not to always be tuned in. Mm. Um, I mean, um, when, it, when I was always tuned in, I suppose really I, I was living two lives, and you can't live two lives, you've got to live one life, haven't you? Um, but I was always tuned in, so wherever I went, I, I could always somehow switch it on. And um, I remember one of my teachers, not, not Gordon, but I had a, a lovely teacher called Mr Brooks, and um, uh, no telephones in those days, not in houses anyway, you, so everything came by letter. And um, I was talking to Mr Brooks and he was saying, maybe you can switch it off. I can't, Mr. Brooks, I keep asking them to turn it off. I don't want to see them when I'm, I'm out uh, with my friends. I don't want it. And he sent me a card through the post and it was a little angel doing this and he said, does it remind you of anyone? And what he was trying to tell me was that actually consciously I was saying I didn't want to see, but subconsciously I did want to see. And that was That's what I say to students today who say, say, say consciously you might be saying it was subconsciously you're desiring it. So if you're desiring it and wanting it, then you're giving the spirit world the permission for it to happen. Yeah. I mean, it was difficult for me to understand that the spirit world can't let break the law. Uh, because the universal law is personal responsibility, whether it's this world or the next. So, uh, Mr. Brooks was trying to explain to me that, you know, the spirit world can't break the law. In other words, if I don't want this, then it's not going to happen because they can't force me into something. Well, that broke my heart. I thought the spirit world could do everything. You know, so it broke my heart for a while. I mean, it was awful because when I came in, I first of all, I lost God on a throne. Because I loved the idea of God being on a throne. Oh, I did. And, and like a father figure that I could go to and ask for my Christmas presents and things. <laughs> and I liked the idea of having a, 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 this marvellous, marvellous Jesus Christ who actually had saved, saved me from sin, so I loved that as well. And then suddenly to, to learn, first of all, that God wasn't on a throne, that he was inside me and I was responsible. And then secondly, that Jesus was the greatest healer and medium and, uh, and um, ultimately uh, really did have these great abilities uh, but really he wasn't there waiting for me to say will you please tell God I want this you know that was a bit of a problem for me so I had a lot of problems when I came in changing over from one religion into um, spiritualism is very difficult We're, it, it may seem easy, but if you have got a, a, an ingrained belief, uh, then changing over into this personal responsibility that, uh, you know, Jesus didn't die on the cross to save us and this didn't happen so that we would be okay all the time. And the more, the more I got involved, the more heavy the res personal responsibility became of the seven principles, I think. Well, coming from a, being a good Catholic boy in the past, when I came into spiritualism and, and I had to change my conception and understanding about God, I found, even though I was, I'd always been a strong believer in prayer and the power of prayer, 
and I felt I couldn't pray anymore because I haven't got that image. It took me quite a while to be able to overcome that difficulty and really find that. Um, I could still pray, but it had to be a different concept and a different way to how I understood it before, but really caused me problems. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's natural that you're a medium. It's natural that you're a psychic. Uh, so you don't need the real religion to say, you don't have to say you're a spiritualist to be a medium. But once you get the mediumship, it starts to open the philo philosophical side, which then opens the other side. And I don't think you can become a spiritualist overnight. No, I, I, I honestly believe that until you've got that perception in, in, in control and, and it's your face, I think you, you are just a natural medium, aren't you? Yeah. Just a natural medium. Um, uh, that's making a lot when people say, oh, I'm a natural medium. Well, if you're a medium, it has to be natural. Yeah, it's it is natural, isn't it? But very difficult to change it because there is a, a faith and a belief and a philosophy behind spiritualism. Um, but it can't make you a medium. But a medium won't necessarily be able to follow that path of the SNU. Because I do, uh, I mean, I've worked with Kabbalic teachers in, uh, in Israel and uh, you know, their face is so strong and so different and everybody's face is different and yet everybody talks about this source, don't they, and this spirit and this sensitivity and, and these visions that they have. It doesn't matter which religion, you, whoever you're talking to, they have vision, they have sight, um, they have that power of insights. So it's all the same and then you see this label and it's, well, does that label suit me? And that was my biggest my biggest battle. Yeah, I mean, we have to accept every, every religion has had the power and the voice of the spirit. It's mm -hmm. the foundation of yeah. most religions. I don't care which yeah. religion you want to speak about, but then we have to look at religion and spirituality as two different things. Mm -hmm. And then also what I've had to look at and question myself, because I didn't think I would be a good enough person for the spirit world to use mm -hmm. as a medium. If I look back at maybe some of the things in my life and being I've done in my life, I thought I wouldn't be good enough. And then I had the message of God and then he spoke about this. And he told me to go and write, uh, buy the book and read the book of St. Paul mm. on the road to Damascus yeah. in his life, what it was before, but he found the light, saw the light, yeah. and changed. Yeah. So that then I thought, well, okay, then I start to be a good boy and change my ways as a person and start looking real. I haven't done that. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I'm going to look at myself yeah. and look at yeah. yeah, so. <coughs> But also, this about questions about spirituality and leadership it doesn't matter. The spiritual growth as a, an individual soul, how much difference it makes in your mediumistic uh, awareness and ability? I think you've got to look at what the word spiritual means, does it? it, it the perception of that word actually for each um, philosophical argument or understanding is different. Um, spirituality for me is just being um, yourself to the best of your ability. Right, and um, I do think when we get to the spirit world, I'm not sure that I'm looking forward to seeing the video of my life. But I have tried, so God loves the trial. But <laughs> you know, we were told God loves the trial. And, and I, I've looked at it all, I think at the end of the day, if, if I were to be honest with you, I've done things my shouldn't have done, I've got things wrong, I've had to upset a few people, whatever. But I can honestly think of myself, I've not done it intentionally. Mm. And I think when we go to the spirit world and we see that video of our life, mm. I think actually it's the motive and intent behind mm. what we expressed in that journey, that, um, rather than mm. the actual thing we've done. Yeah, I think the other problem I've got is that, you know, I hope that when I've given anybody advice or anything, and I've said your mother is saying this, I hope to God she did say it. <laughs> when I get over there, I don't want a list of people saying my name in vain. You know, that's the other, that's the other side of the coin, isn't it? I've said to some shows, you know, but I've said your dad has said this, and it messes your life up, and your dad never told me that at all. When I get to the spirit world, your dad's going to be right in there to punch me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> it's scary when you think about it. Because you know, we're going to be responsible for everything we've said and done in there now. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. It's scary. It is, yes, that's why I'm living to another hundred percent. <laughs> <laughs> because then they'll have gone on, and they'll have gone on and on and on and on. <laughs> so I won't have to catch up with them. All oh, right, I might get away with it. Um, but I do think, I do think that's, that, that's the other part of it, isn't it, really? Um, uh, it's not wrong for us to be able to say, look, um, I can't hear your mum saying this, but I know. Because if we say we know, then it's coming from the psychic or from the prediction side of it. I do think that still happens, and I know we're not allowed to do predictions, but I don't think you can avoid that. Because I think that's part of the soul's mediumship. So you've got, you know, as long as we've got that identification, then when the predictions come up, because we've come from the genetic structure of us, is we've come up from people that could predict, could tell fortunes, could uh, predict catastrophes in the world. That's the gene that's come up through us. So we're obviously going to be able to do it. And I think as long as we're honest and we can say, look, I feel this, or I see that with you, rather than the spirit world sees it, I think we're okay. I think we're okay. Mm -hmm. But, there you yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah. So, if we look out here, is there anybody do you think that's listening um, <laughs> in this world um, or the next world who would like to ask us a question? Do you think? <coughs> anybody got a question for us? Oh, what would it talk to about? Yeah. 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 Ye
choose somebody from, uh, like by in here, this, this amount of people, and you just pick a person out and then ask them to do something. And that's the way he taught. He didn't actually tell you what to do. I mean, for an example, for me, he, he got me out, and he says, Paul, he said, I want you to make a contact, but it has to be for somebody at the back of the room. And I said to him, why and how? And he looked at me and he said, that's for you to find out. <laughs> so, well, I did it, but it did teach me something. But also, he was also testing me out to see if I had got the ability to achieve that. And he thought, I had to, what were we saying? And so, basically, what he taught me was, I simply achieved it was by trusting, but also by go, going to God, because I just simply said, God, give me what this man wants. <laughs> I was aware of my communicator and I just trusted. I said, I want to come to the back row. I've got so and so, so and so up here. Yes, it worked. Yeah. And that's what he would do. He would ask you to do things, and uh, would not actually tell you how to do it. He would make you work and find the answers. Don't you find that's that, that's also, you learn the law about yourself and, and that's what's the lot is missing now. And if it's all given to you on a plate, you don't discover your own, your own strength really. And I think that would be nice. When I first came to classes, I, I didn't come here to be a medium or I, I actually came here to discover myself. Uh, and and I mean, that's actually really tremendous, isn't it? Um, and even to find your pathway, um, we need speakers, we need, we desperately are in need of speakers, good speakers that can hold people in the palm of the hand, that can hold you um, uh, for an hour and leave a residue for you to continue your search. That's what we need. Um, and, and that's something that I know at the moment the SNU are building on and, and it will be good. But if you look at the foundation stone, um, of what we do. Mediumship isn't to be all and end all, but what it is, it is what makes us different from any other religion. Because we don't say there is life after death. We prove that there is life after death. And that's what makes us different. And that quality, if you can add the philosophy to that quality, I mean, I don't know how many of you have read the Lyceum Manual, but the Lyceum Manual says that the aim of spiritualism is to complete an at-one-ment between God and man until every action, thought and deed is in accordance with his law. So that has nothing to do with mediumship. That is the aim of spiritualism. And, and what gives us that belief system is that we can prove the miracle of communication. And that's another thing that we don't talk about. Gordon would talk about <coughs> mediumship is a miracle. Communication with the other world is a miracle taking place. And it's taking place in this century, not in a, a you know, in Jesus' time and then died. It didn't die. That miracle is still continuing, but because it's become so common, <coughs> mediumship has become ordinary and commonplace. And we don't look at the absolute beauty of the soul anymore. We don't look at the connection with the spirit of ourselves to this God source anymore. With that feeling that we are taking part in a miracle. But it is a miracle. Um, and everything we do to do with spirit, whether it's incarnate or discarnate, we should feel we are part of a miracle. And you, you get people coming out from a workshop and they'll just say, I mean, I did it when I started, so please don't think I'm, you know, I've been very good all the time for that. But you come out sometimes and I say, oh, that was dreadful. I was absolutely awful. Um, forgot all about the miracle that had taken place, that actually I'd been touched. Not that I delivered evidence or a message that was accepted <coughs> and was 100%. But I actually have been touched by the, by the spirit world. And that in itself should have given me the upliftment to know that I've been part of a miracle. And we don't teach that anymore. We don't teach you to have the reverence of what we're involved with. And it, it's a reverence. And what we take part in is something that is created by an intelligence that is so superior to anything that anybody knows. 
Um, and it's actually taking place because we are part of it. We are not excluded from it. So that would be where I would be wanting to go. I would be wanting to bring the miracle and the reverence alive again in our mediums so that, uh, and in our churches and our centres and our theatres. Yes, darling. And um, Meg, do you feel um, then that sometimes we're fully tapped into how spirit wants to work with us? Or do you feel that there's still a lot more to come because obviously you've got the trance, you've got the spirit art? Because um, I find that sometimes with the teachings that they want to pigeonhole you, they want to restrict how you work. I remember being in a church circle and I got told you can't work like that, and it, it, which is what I took myself out. So do you feel we tend to restrict ourselves in the way we work with spirit? No, we don't restrict ourselves, but what happens is there is cycles. So uh, you, at the moment we've got this influx of physical mediumship coming up at the moment. Now that has been way out, it's been, uh, there's been very, very few physical mediums for a good number of years and now that's coming back in again. And it's as if there is a cycle uh, that connects to this God source that says now this is the time for this to rise and then this is the time for the next part to rise. What I would say to you is, in, in the development of your mediumship, is this, that if you are aware within your soul, and the decision within your soul is that you are going to explore everything, then by all means explore it. But remember, being a jack of all trades means you don't master one. And sometimes we have to be content, because we're not this great man that was called Jesus that did all these miracles. We're not, we're not that highly evolved, if you want to say it, put it that way. So perhaps we together, collectively, if we do the very best that we can do in one aspect, but you bring all the aspects together, then you are displaying the greater miracle of what communication is about. And that's how I see it. Would you agree with that? Oh, definitely. But, uh, I think we've also written on the other side where the students are deciding what type of medium she Yeah, I just think the spirit wants us to do more than what we see, do. See, that's your mistake, yeah. what spirit wants us to do. Mm -hmm. It's not about the spirit world, it's about you, and it's about your soul. What does your soul want you to do? It doesn't, it, you, you put the spirit world in a position of responsibility where actually the responsibility is within you and your soul. So your, does your soul want you to do this, or does your soul want you to do that? Because the spirit world will respond to whichever direction you and your soul wish to take. And I think that taking that responsibility is tough. It's much easier and nicer and kinder to your mind if you can say, well, the spirit world have told me I've got to do this. It kind of negates your responsibility to a degree. And we, we can't negate that responsibility to the God source uh, because that is part and parcel of the miracle. And that, you know, we've got to look at it from that point that we must be responsible as medium. Yes, I would agree. Does the spirit world come in before you are aware that you're a medium, yes. But the soul has ignited to such a degree so that you are seeing naturally what was around you all the time. So the spirit world hasn't suddenly appeared in your home to tell you what to do. They've been there all the time, but your soul's ignited so you can see. And that's the difference between it, that's the duality. And that's where we learn responsibility for what we have and nurture that God source that's within, that, al uh, that allows the soul to project to the spirit world. Mm -hmm. Does that yeah. apply to children as well? Yes, children it does depend. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're talking about children, aren't you, in ages here, yes. whereas the soul is yeah. timeless, so it hasn't got an age. Mm -hmm. So that's why children get it, uh, and it's because genetically it has risen to such a degree mm -hmm. and it's necessary for the soul to have that expression within a child for a certain length of time. Then it will back down yeah. and the, the soul will quieten and the, the child will then go on with their material life and then it will ignite again. 
and the soul knows the architect's plan. So it will, uh, but, but the soul is not age. The soul has no age. But we think that child, well, should a child have to see the spirit? Well, yes, I think so. I think it would be rather wonderful. All right. Thank you. That it, does that make sense to you, totally what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, but it's so easy for you to shelve the responsibility onto the spirit world and onto the guides and the inspirers where actually, once you take the responsibility of the architect's plan, then it will change your, your approach to your mediumship. You'll look after it more, you'll tend it more, and you will know you're taking part in a miracle. You will know that. And you'll know that the conscious mind, and you know in the Bible, it's, sorry, Paul, I'm going on. Okay. I'll just do this bit and then you take off. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good job on our own friends. <laughs> There's a, there's a saying in, 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 in the Christian Bible, and it's the lion shall lie down with the lamb. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that uh, spiritually, you're looking at the conscious mind being the lion and the soul being the lamb. And these two have to be in harmony for you to be able to go forward on a spiritual path. So the two have to be at one, with one thought and one purpose. Once those two are at one, uh, then you will rise and you'll just go forward. And that's what you do. Next question to Paul. Could you say something about the, um, the difference between the ego and the soul and whether, you, whether there's a conflict? And are you, are you, when you're talking about the consciousness, is that to do with the ego? Well, first, after all, people want to speak about the ego in the negative, mm. and it's not. Yeah, I'll be honest with you, no medium could stand up here and work. We could stand, sit here now doing this in front of an audience if we wasn't using the aspect of the ego. It's really possible. It's keeping that balance right. It's a very positive aspect if we use it in the right way. Yeah, I think that we've gone way out with ego. Um, and it's been changed and it, uh, we don't want anybody to be egotistical and think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, but you do have to have that reliance on soul and if that's the ego then yeah you need that because that's the power that will boost and take you forward doing this job. Well, we've got to have, have, have that knowing and that confidence in who we are and what we're doing. Um, and if that's ego, <coughs> you know, it, 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 it's a positive thing. It, can I elaborate a little bit? Yeah. I was told after my husband died that his that his soul knew it was time for him to go, but his ego um, wanted to, to stay. That's that's sort of what I'm. That our ego perhaps isn't perhaps I'm, perhaps it's not the right term. I, I wouldn't think that was to do with ego myself. Not, In no. my understanding of the word ego, I mean I, I, I've come across yeah. this on numerous occasions where. I've said to somebody about their loved one, you know, and their spirit was ready to go for some time, but they couldn't let go because they've still got that desire yeah. to stay here, which is natural because yeah. maybe they haven't had the time they wanted. They haven't wanted to leave those people behind who are going to grieve for them, but uh, I want to put it in well, that facet of the, of the expression yeah. of the ego. And you know, you can't help you can't help having an ego with this job for a little while. You will be a bit egotistic. You will, because look what you're doing. You're doing something that hundreds and hundreds of people can't do, and it's bound to make you feel a bit special. But it doesn't take long for you to actually balance it out until you recognise that no, you're not special, but you're a very important person to the spirit world. We do have to give ourselves acknowledgement as well in what, in what we do. We, we, we're easy um, enough to pull ourselves apart uh, in what we're doing uh, when we're not satisfied or feel we've done what we should in the way we should. Um, so I always believe in giving myself acknowledgement, okay, in, in what I've done in my work with the spirit world. But then I also have to look at myself as a whole in other aspects, but not in a negative, destructive way. We were speaking about this a little yesterday. Uh, because we're only human, uh, where mediumship is concerned, you know, that only goes to use in all that aspects, 
and there's many aspects to us that can move into a positive and negative that will interfere with that work we do. It is a difficult one that, you know, um, you can have someone that, that really is, is, has got this balance and has such a strong belief in what they're doing that they talk with such passion that people think they're being egotistical and they're not, they're just talking about their passion and what they believe in. Um, but it's so easy to give people labels, isn't it? Um, you know, what's that saying? Um, don't look for the fleck in somebody else's eye till you've seen the, your own, fleck in your own. Yeah. Okay. Hi, ladies. Uh, hi, Paul. Um, you were speaking earlier on about the soul and about the spirit. Um, how important it is for, with blending and, and meditation to bring all the aspects of that into one? How important is that on this journey? Well, it depends what you mean by meditation. That's <laughs> okay. what okay. Yeah, you know, maybe so. It's her personal view about meditation. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've got to look at it. It's, a lot of meditation is not meditation anyway. It's it's contemplation, it's relaxation, reflection. Uh, but you don't have to sit in a formal sense of meditation. Uh, maybe not quite in the same way as Mavis, but I don't. I can in a way do the same thing in what people mean by meditating in you know, an awareness and communicating with my own soul, but it doesn't have to be in that formal sense. I can do it in, in other aspects and in my life. You know, actually sometimes even when I'm driving, believe it or not, uh, and I, I find actually I am going along the motorway and I should have got off junction three and I've got off at junction I'm at junction seven because I mean that sort of awareness, even just by suddenly walking and, and going on a walk, I can do my type of meditation. My name is Lloyd Sir Ironing, don't you mind? Yes, I like to iron and I like to, 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 to blend. <laughs> I love ironing and I love cleaning, my favourite pastime. Um, but ironing in particular, I love, I love doing. And, and really, uh, it's the blending, we are naturally spirit. We are naturally spirit, we're a spirit incarnate. So we are naturally capable of blending with the discarnate. But we're also naturally capable of blending the spirit, the soul, and the conscious mind. So we actually can get the trinity moving yeah. in harmony in many different places. But you know, if you're going to do meditation or contemplation or at uh, least do you feel the divine presence? Because if you're doing meditation, it should be that you have come to, to a point where you are uplifted by a source that is beyond comprehension. It should be a stillness that is, is so much reflected in sound. It should be all things, but you should be able to feel it. And many people, they sit in meditation and they come out, but well, there's no change in them. Meditation and contemplation should make a difference. It should make a change to you. And you should be able to feel the change in the very being of you, but in the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual, you should be aware that you have blended with that source that's within to such a degree. And you know, you get people that they meditate all the time, every day, but then it becomes normal. Then it becomes something, oh goodness gracious me, I must go and sit in my room because I haven't meditated today. It, it then becomes unnatural instead of natural. And I honestly believe that the natural way is the best. I mean, maybe just about, uh, about the emotion and the I am mind, and then there's that sort of that power, that divine, um, the spirit, and um, the, the soul is the vehicle of those three things. So, you know, when I come to work with my mediumship, it's quite natural for me to work with those three elements in my mediumship because in my everyday, I'm not just being aware and experiencing my everyday life, whatever I'm doing with my conscious mind, at the same time, but even now, just sitting here, I'm allowing my soul and those aspects within my soul 
to feel and experience what's taking place at the moment, not just with my conscious mind. So in a way, living that all the time, that awareness, even in that everyday life. So I feel for me that's more beneficial than sitting in formal meditation. I got thrown out of so many meditation circles. I gave up. <laughs> uh, stay still for the, the amount of time you have to sit still. Um, I was wanting to look at my watch after three minutes, and after five minutes I wanted to fidget, and after ten I wanted to cross my legs. So I got thrown out of circles. So it never suited me. Um, but walking in the wood and just being at one with the indwelling power and actually allowing my conscious mind to become at peace with the indwelling power. And I think that really, you've hit it if you can get to that. Yeah. That indwelling power. Um, but you know, there's so many different ways of doing it. And you have to use your unique way. Yeah, We're all unique, unique, you know. And even though we are talking, and even though you go on all these courses, and you sit and you listen to people like us, uh, at the end of the day, your soul and you are your best trainers. So each of us is unique and individual. So the spirit world can only work with us, or we can only have that awareness in a different ways in the individual we are, in our um, spiritual being, our emotional being, and in our mental state of being. Because that's what they've got to work with, nothing else. So, and we're all different um, in all those different aspects. So there's going to be that difference. And that's why very much of this is so individual and personal. And if we look at the teaching and training of mediumship today, um, I question whether at the time we've got it wrong, that we've become too mechanical. And it's like a machine manufacturing um, and taking away the naturalness because it has to be from that naturalness. We spoke about natural mediumship. Yes, then after that there may have to be an understanding how to deliver, present, whatever in your communication, but we're restricting the spirit world so much in the way they can work with us on how we want to receive the information, what information we want to receive. They know what to bring. And they know what you're capable of receiving, how you can receive it. You know, if, if I go to demonstrate now and say to people, well, right, I want my clairvoyantly to see this, though, and the other, and that's not the way they want to bring it, or they can't bring what they want to bring, or my faculties and energies are not right for my clairvoyance, it's not going to work, it's going to limit. And even with the type of evidence, you know, you know if you're going to be taught that you've got to be that type of information in that structure, in that <coughs> order, how boring your mediumship is going to be, and secondly, how limited to what the spirit will probably want to bring. And, and actually you're bearing witness to wonderful memories that don't belong to you, they belong to someone in another world. So we have to respect that as well. So I think we've got to start relaxing and letting go. <laughs> And if anybody should tell you you've got to do something, then run in the opposite direction. Because you have to have, if you like, we're lights on the path, but we're not the path. We might be the morning, but we're not the day. All we can do is give advice, and then you have to go away with your soul. And my, a good one to think about is my soul and I. Are my soul and I at peace with this? If my soul and I are at peace with this, then I can go forward. If my conscious mind is not at peace or my soul is not at peace, then let me just step back, look at it, until I have got that equilibrium between the two. And then I will be about my father's business. And remember, it's not your business, it's God's business you're about. All right. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, can I, on your behalf, thank very much Mavis and Paul. I think, to be honest, they've touched our souls in some way today. And I think it's been a pleasure for us to be able to share in their conversation with each other. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together.